Good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to the space. Our goal is to help you develop that habit of getting into Scripture every day. It's a habit that'll change your life. It will. That's what God's Word does. And really, us having that intentionality in our walk with God does wonders. Yeah. My name is Rebecca. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host. I say welcome. Uh, today we are in Psalms. We're going to be grazing over Psalms 51 to 55, but we're going to spend a little bit more time in three of them. So uh, I'm excited that you'll be with us. I'm going to wait just a second for friends who join us in the live to let me know that the signal and everything is good. And then we're going to pray and get started. I feel like I really needed my caffeine today. All right, guys. Good morning, Melanie and Bonnie. Yes, prayers. Absolutely, Bonnie. Glad you could join us today. All right, guys. Speaking of prayers, let's go ahead and pray. Make sure, yep, like John and Darlene. Good morning, guys. Last day of school over there. We've got another week, roughly. I know that kids are counting down. It's got the energy in the room, right? Hi, Gloria. Good morning. John, it's great to see you, man. All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for our friends. God, thank you for this space. New friends and old friends, like-hearted, like-minded people that want to draw close to you. Thank you. Thank you that our presence is an encouragement to one another. I know they're an encouragement to me. Bless this time, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, let's go ahead. Now, uh, I'm going to pull up again the slide that lets you see the scriptures that we're doing today along with tomorrow and Friday so that you can see that. Today we're looking at Psalms 51 to 55. Tomorrow will be 56 through 60. Okay, these are, I say titles, it's really more like themes depending on the translation of your Bible. They might word the title differently, but this is roughly what it's about. Uh, 51 is prayer for restoration. 52, God judges the proud. 53, a portrait of sinners. 54, a prayer for deliverance. And 55, betrayal of a friend. All of these psalms, by the way, were written by David. Now, so far, usually what I've said is, hey, we're not going to read through all the psalms. Like, we're not even going to try. Uh, we're just going to take a selection in this particular selection. We're going to read a majority of it together because... There are three psalms in this selection of five that have specific moments in David's life that are attached to them. And I thought, well, when you know that background, then when you're reading the words, it just makes all the more sense. So let's go ahead and let's read together. We're going to start at Psalm 51. This psalm was written after the prophet Nathan came to David and confronted him about Bathsheba. Do you remember this? And it wasn't just the fact that David was sleeping with another man's wife. It's the fact that he then sent that man to the front lines to kill him, to hide David's guilt because Bathsheba was pregnant. Do you remember this story? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, the thing that I'm reminded of is that um, no man is without sin. And even these incredible people of faith that we know and that we love, um, they also make some really, really bad mistakes. Yeah. Uh, but for the grace of God go I, right? You remember that phrase? Okay, let's go ahead and read this knowing that this is the moment, all right? David says, be gracious to me, God according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion. Blot out my rebellion. Completely wash away my guilt. Cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion. And my sin is always before me, against you, you alone. I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop 
and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. <coughs> Excuse me. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, O oh God. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, and bulls will be offered on your altar. I'm going to pull the slides back for a second. This is one. First of all, do you recognize a few verses in there? Do you recognize a few that sound familiar? Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Right? Yeah. Um, sorry, that's driving me crazy. Oh, there we go. Um, one of my favorite verses that I quote all the time uh, in my own heart is, you do not delight in sacrifice or I will bring it. You don't take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. Yeah. Um, this idea that God cares about the heart more than religious ritual. That's what interests God the most, is the stuff in the heart. I love that this psalm, that we can connect it with this moment of deep repentance in David's heart. Because Nathan had confronted him, and he knew he had royally blown it. He had been doing the sin in secret and then he'd been covering up this sin, just trying to, to keep it from coming out. And of course, God shines his light on things that sometimes we wish would stay in the darkness. Yeah. I just want us to look at these words again. I love how he says in two and three, completely wash away my guilt, cleanse me from my sin. There's this acknowledgement. He knows. He knows what's going on. He says, verse 3, I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. I find it interesting that in verse 4 he says, Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. Only because um, we could say that the evil wasn't done only against God, right? Against uh, Bathsheba and against her husband, right? Sins were done there too. But David, he's not like trying to minimize those things, but he's recognizing that the greatest offense is, is his sin against God, his selfishness, his rebellion against God. Do you know a song that captures these words? Create a clean heart, renew a steadfast spirit within me. The translation that I know is, cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. I hear it in my head, do you? Are you singing it? Create in me a clean heart, O God. Yeah. I love it when we can put a melody along to a psalm because it helps us memorize scripture. Yeah. I see Gloria, Judy. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. I want to come again to this 
uh, verse 16 and 17. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. When someone had sinned, when someone had done wrong against God, the appropriate response was to bring offering, uh, to bring some uh, animal for an atonement sacrifice to be made, for blood to be shed as a pardon for sin, to bring an offering to the Lord, right? And so I love that David knows, David knows that that's not really what does anything. There are some people that could say, oh yeah, no, 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 I'm going to go and I'm going to offer sin or offer a sacrifice for my sin. And they could take something to the temple all the while they don't really feel it in their heart. So I love that this, this phrase, this psalm, this section of David, he's like, offerings mean nothing if my heart is not in it. They mean nothing. What God is looking for is not um, an animal being slaughtered in the temple. God wants a repentant and broken heart. All right. Psalm 52 Okay, this is another moment in David's life, but I want to point out the phrase there. Do you see a maskil of David? A maskil? Uh, Some ask, what is that, right? And, And to some degree, we're left guessing a little bit. But... In general, this this word maskil, the root of it means this uh, wisdom or understanding. So it's a thought that it could be a song of wisdom, a song of wisdom. That's going to make more sense when we look at some of the other themes. For example, um, a portrait of sinners and betrayal of a friend. Those don't like glorify God in the way that we would think a normal psalm does, right? Um, declaring God's greatness from the heavens. Those two psalms don't have anything to do with it. But they're a maskel because they're bringing in wisdom. It's a song of wisdom and insight. Yeah. Okay, so this one says God judges the proud. And if you look at it, so this, it says, when Doeg the Edomite went and reported to Saul, telling him David went to Ahimelech's house. It's in 1 Samuel, you can look it up, 22 and 23. This moment where David is running for his life from Saul. And this guy, this Edomite, tells Saul not only that David, you know, is in this direction, but he throws under the bus Ahimelech, who is a priest. What happens after this, guys, is that Saul goes and slaughters Ahimelech and all the priests. It's this awful awful moment where Saul is upset and he retaliates and he sheds innocent blood. So this psalm, a masculine, because you're going to see he's not actually talking to God at all. He is calling out the wickedness of Saul. Look at it. Verse 1, why boast about evil, you hero? God's faithful love is constant. So you see, he's not speaking to God. He he might refer to God, but he's speaking more to the one who's doing evil. Verse 2, like a sharpened razor, your tongue devises destruction, working treachery. You love evil instead of good, lying instead of speaking truthfully. Selah, that breath, that pause, interlude. You love any words that destroy, you treacherous tongue. This is why God will bring you down forever. He will take you, ripping you out of your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. Selah. The righteous will see and fear, and they will derisively say about that hero, here is the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, taking refuge in his destructive behavior. But I... I'm like a flourishing olive tree in the house of God. I trust in God's faithful love forever and ever. I will praise you forever for what you've done. In the presence of your faithful people, I will put my hope in your name, for it is good. So we can see the majority of this psalm 
uh, it is a word of wisdom because it's pointing out the, the truth, the reality that wisdom and folly are completely against God and his heart and they will be brought to justice, right? And then at the end though, David, I think because his heart, we all, I usually, when I'm reading Psalms of David, there I call it a beat change. I learned that I think probably from um, like a speech class or something many, many years ago. It's where there's a pause, a breath, the tone shifts, maybe the focus shifts, like a new paragraph kind of thing. Uh, we see there in verses eight and nine, there's the shift, but I am like a flourishing olive tree in the house of God. And then verse nine, he's actually now talking directly to God. I will praise you now, God, forever for what you've done. Yeah. Okay, Psalm 53. This is one that I'm not going to spend all the time having us read every verse, even though we've just read all of 51 and 52. Um, again, this is a math skill, and so I grab the first few verses so you can see what the focus and stuff is, but I didn't spend as much time in this one. I hope that's okay. I encourage you to read it on your own. Portrait of sinners. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and they do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. That phrase, by the way, is quoted in the New Testament. I don't know if you recognize that. There's no one who does good, not one, right? Um, that came from David. And he's looking at a portrait of sinners. Uh, now, again, Psalms is not chronological. So there is, there is a method to how they ordered it. We don't know what that method is. But we can see this is, okay, first in 51, David was the sinner. 50, I'm sorry, 52, Saul was the sinner. 53, we see a portrait of sinners. And we see David, who we would say loves God, right? Loves God, wants to honor him. And yet David is saying there is no one righteous, not one. Yeah. Psalm 54. This is another specific moment. All right. A maskil, so a song kind of of wisdom. When the Ziphites went to and said to Saul, is David not hiding among us. This is another moment, and actually it's really close in the timeline. Sorry, I pulled my hair back if you're wondering why I'm surprised. Um, or why I'm different. The the moment in the timeline of David's life is like right in the same breath of Ahimelech and uh Saul killing all the priests. It's right in that moment. So right after that, again, David is running for his life, and here's another person that's trying to win favor with Saul by telling Saul where David is. And actually, they do this twice. You see it in 1 Samuel 23, and then you see again in 26. So this is a moment where David is being, um, I'm struggling with the word. Remind me what this word is when someone, I mean, I would say betrayal, but it isn't quite betrayal yet, but he's being told on. What's the word, guys? Come on. My brain's a little misfiery this morning. Okay, so let's read this. Verse 1, God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. God, hear my prayer. Listen to the words from my mouth. For strangers rise up against me and violent men intend to kill me. They do not let God guide them. Selah. Well, that's fitting, isn't it? Don't you see the, the whole picture of it right there? Verse 4, God is my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my life. He will repay my adversaries for their evil. Because of your faithfulness, annihilate them. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, Lord, because it is good. For he has rescued me from every trouble, and my eye has looked down on my enemies. Meaning that God has elevated him, right? That's Psalm 54. That's it. The last one that we're going to read today as we wrap up is Psalm 55. And this one is called A Betrayal 
by a friend. Now, I didn't capture every verse in 55 because it's the probably the longest one of our selection this week. Um, still not very long, but long enough. But here we go. Psalm 55, again, this is a mascal, so it has this song of wisdom feeling to it. Tattle. Yeah, that's a good word, Melanie. He was tattled on. That's right. <laughs> Verse 1. Here we go. God, listen to my prayer. Do not hide from my plea for help. Pay attention to me and answer me. I am restless and in turmoil with my complaint. Because of the enemy's words, because of the pressure of the wicked. For they bring down disaster on me and harass me in anger. Verse 4. My heart shudders within me. Terrors of death sweep over me. Fear and trembling grip me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, if only I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and find rest. How far away I would flee. I would stay in the wilderness, Silah. I would hurry to my shelter from the raging wind and the storm. Pause for a moment. Uh, that, that verse that said, if only I had wings like a dove and I would just fly away. Anyone else like uh, <laughs> the scene of the movie in Forrest Gump? Did that get anyone else? Like, Lord, make me a bird so I can fly far, far away. Great. Uh, sorry, I digress. But I like connecting things because it helps it stick in my mind. <laughs> Yes. Verse 6, I had said, if only I had wings like a dove, I would fly away and find rest. Verse 9, Lord, confuse and confound their speech, for I see violence and strife in this city. I'm just going to pause there again too. Lord, confuse and confound their speech. That's, that's a prayer. Honestly, that phrase, I pray that prayer I haven't in a long time, but when I feel like there's someone who is stirring something, um, rather than get like really upset about it, um, rather than freaking out or trying to correct or be, take on that posture of defensiveness, instead I would say, Lord, confuse and confound their speech. Confuse them. Yeah. Mess up the words in their mouth because they're speaking evil, right? Verse 10, day and night they make the round on its walls. Crime and trouble are within it. Destruction is inside it. Oppression and deceit never leave its market's place. Verse 12, now it is not an enemy who insults me, otherwise I could bear it. It is not a foe who rises up against me, otherwise I could hide from him. But it is you, a man who is my peer, my companion and good friend. We used to have close fellowship when we walked with the crowd in the house of God. Pausing for a moment. There is question about who that is, right? Um, one might say, was it Saul? Because they, they did live very much together. David was his armor bearer and David stayed in close proximity to him. Is it possible? Yes. But I don't know that David would have ever called Saul his companion and close friend. When I think of that, I first think of Jonathan, Saul's son. However, I'm still thinking in the early part of David's life, it's very possible that he could be referring to or pointing to his son, Absalom. Like he could be referring to or pointing to um, someone else. But it's worth thinking about. Yeah, I'm going to read that again, verse 12. It's not an enemy who insults me, otherwise I could bear it. It's not a foe who rises up against me, otherwise I could hide from him. But it is you, a man who is my peer, my companion and good friend. We used to have fellowship when we walked with the crowd into the house of God. As we were reading that a second time, I'm pausing because I just felt like I needed to. Um, it is possible that there are people in this community right now where you have experienced betrayal, possibly even from a, a church person, someone that you thought was in your circle and felt like they turned against you. Um, I wish I could say that that doesn't happen, but that would be naive. It happens. 
I pray that you just find some measure of comfort as you're bringing that to the Lord, as you're seeking not to just let your heart get hard. You're not, you're, you know, striving to have the Holy Spirit help you not to become bitter and, you know, deeply wounded. I'm praying that you also sense that you are not alone. David wrote these words, which echo your heart, right? You're not alone. Verse 16, here's a beat change. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. I complain and groan morning, noon, and night, and he hears my voice. Though many are against me, he will redeem me from my battle unharmed. God, the one enthroned from long ago, will hear and will humiliate them. Selah, so breath interlude, musical pause, right? Because they do not change and do not fear God. This psalm continues. As I said, I didn't actually grab all the verses, but I want to wrap up with verse 22. I did include that today. It says this, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Cast your cares on him. He'll sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. I pray that today. I think of pastor friends who have been hurt by the churches that they were there to shepherd. That's coming to my mind this morning. I'm thinking of people who served and gave everything they had wanting to serve God and serve their faith community, and they've been hurt by them. I don't know why. I, I, I feel like it's the Holy Spirit. There's a reason that that's coming up today, and so I'm just, I'm just wanting to acknowledge it. And if that's hitting you where you are, I want you to know that God is trying to speak to you right now. Cast your cares on him. Yes, he will sustain you. He will not allow the righteous to be shaken. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. We relate. We find comfort. We see that the voice of our heart is captured in some of these Psalms of David. God, thank you for this moment. Let us bring all of it to you. Whether it's sin that we repent of, like David with the moment with Bathsheba and her husband. Whether it's um, struggle from someone that is coming up against whether it's hurt and betrayal from people that we loved. Help us connect with you today in an honest, authentic way. In your name, amen. 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 The word I hear as we wrap up is healing. God will bring healing. He'll bring healing from your, um, your past sin. God can heal. There, there might still be consequence, right? But God can heal uh, and not allow that to consume you and be death to your spirit. God can also heal you of the wounds that other people have made. Yeah. Is this hitting with anyone today? I feel like it is. I just, I just really feel that. But I would really love to know if you could send me a message or put in the comments. You don't have to say very much. You're welcome to do it privately. I will be happy to pray for you. But... Um, I'm just trusting that that's for someone today. All right, guys, that's it for today. I will see you tomorrow. We're going to go 56 to 60, Psalms 56 to 60. I uh, hope that you'll join me. We'll see you later. Bye.